packet from UIC and the title of this talk. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, I'll be talking about an introduction to positive characteristic invariance of singularities as a follow-up to uh, Rob's talk. Um, uh, my handwriting tends to go in and out of legibility, so if it goes out and you'd like to fix that, please uh, let me know and I can attempt to do so. Um, and if you uh, have any questions at any point, please just speak up. All right, so, um, uh, so for the entire talk, let me just fix a... Uh, perfect field uh, of characteristic P. Um, so uh, strictly speaking, I can do a little better than this in general, but uh, I want to avoid any bad technical details. So you're free to um, uh, keep in mind just letting K be FP if you want for essentially the entire talk. All right. Um, so just as before, I want to start off and uh, look at uh, a hypersurface uh, and some number of variables. So let me let the polynomial ring for the talk uh, be denoted by R. And let's say in n variables. And again, let's assume that my hypersurface vanishes at the origin. And I want to study Um, the the hypersurface defined by f inside of say affine space over k. Um, now uh, in the previous talk it was mentioned uh, that I'm really want to look uh, locally analytically at the origin. I don't really have that uh, available here. So I would like to write something like like this, but of course convergence doesn't make sense because they don't have any topology. So um, essentially you're free to keep in mind that uh, most of the time uh, f can also be a power series, but it's a formal one. Okay. All right, great. So. Um, uh, Last, uh, last hour, we heard uh, about what it means for a zero to be, say, a smooth point. Um, and of course, this means if I'm working over the complex numbers that I have something which locally looks like a complex manifold. But again, I don't have uh, such technology at my disposal. So um, let me uh, say what I mean if I'm working in positive characteristic. All right, we're going to say that the origin is a smooth uh, point. Again, um, just mimicking the, um, one of the characterizations in characteristic zero here, if and only if the multiplicity is one, or in other words, one of the partial derivatives at the origin is not zero. OK? Um, and of course, um, I can't say that this means that f locally looks uh, like a complex manifold, but I can say that uh, the formal completion the formal completion is a power series ring. So still, in some sense, if you look locally analytically, it looks like something uh, um, are related to power series. OK? All right. And again, uh, I'll use many of the same examples from the previous talk, in particular uh, the two that I have in mind that I'll use quite a bit. Um, say, uh, the standard cusp or the standard node, if you want, uh, are these are examples of plane curves. Now, it was mentioned in the previous talk um, 
right? All of these pictures involve some kind of a lie. Okay, so um, we were working over the complex numbers, but I only drew the real points. You might object that my pictures are even more of a lie if I'm working over F2 than it was previously said, right? So if I'm working over the complex numbers, you can say actually quite a bit about what these things look like, right? So um, here, locally and analytically at the origin, I have two, uh, two planes meeting transversely at a point in four space, if you want. Here, um, uh, you have something which, uh, so these uh, Pousseau uh, exponents uh, and, and invariants were mentioned, something which looks like the cone over a trefoil knot, right, in, uh, in, in S3. Um, but in, in R4. All right, so while well, you can't say these things, all these things are just heuristics. And the key point here is that at a general point, uh, assuming you take um, uh, your hypersurface down here um, to not have any repeated factors, right? So at a general point, it will be smooth, but at these special points, they will be singular, right? And those are what I'm trying to study. OK, so we're working in positive characteristic. I don't have uh, the ability to appeal to integration or any analytic techniques, but what I do have the ability to use is the Frobenius endomorphism. OK, so what is that? All right, so here's the star. All right, so the Frobenius endomorphism, which you're likely familiar with, right, is just the peak power map. Um, on the elements of the ring. And of course, the point here is that this is a ring endomorphism. Right? So um, uh, why? Well, the freshman's dream holds, as they say. So um, <laughs> um, f plus g to the p is f to the p plus g to the p. And of course, uh, what's the reason here? So if I look at the binomial coefficients here, right? these are all 0 mod p when k is between 0 and p. Right? So if I just expand using the binomial theorem, um, the only terms that survive are the two, two ends. Okay. All right, so um, of course it's an endomorphism. So the real power comes from the fact that since the source and target are the same, I can do it as many times as I want. Right? So um, let's do that right away. We'll just leave that. OK, um, great. So I have this East Frobenius map. And I said the real power is you can do it as many times as you want, but we've already done that. So now the fact that the source and target are the same is a source of infinite confusion. All right, so let's fix that. Oh my. All right, so how are we going to fix that? Well, if I take this guy. Um, R is a domain. So the only way that the p to the power of something is 0 is if it's 0 to begin with. So that's actually just an injective ring endomorphism. So um, I have a, this gives an isomorphism of R onto its image subring. Right? So this Frobenius map is equivalent to the inclusion of the image subring inside the target. Right. What is the image subring? The image subring is just the set of p to the eth powers. Inside of R. All right. So again, all I've really done is decorate everything with a p to the e. Right. So um, now I've fixed the problem. That the source and target are not the same. And of course, I can write all these th things down very explicitly. So here, R again was our polynomial ring. And this image subring, well, I've assumed that my field here is perfect. So um, if I take anything um, 
it's uh, any scalar, it's already a p to the eth power to begin with, right? So this subring here is just um, itself the polynomial ring, but I think of the uh, variables as being the p to the eth powers of the variables over there. Okay. All right, great. So I want to do the same thing again, but in a slightly different manner. This maybe is less uh, less obvious. All right, so instead of looking at the PDD powers of elements of R, I'm going to tweak this whole picture and look at roots instead. OK? Um, and so again, uh, I just want to think about this. And I'll say quite a bit more about this. Right? Um, so the target ring I can think of as instead of just saying here, the variables are the p to the eth powers of the variables on the right side. I want to think of the variables over here as the p to the eth. OK, so the variables over here as the p to the eth roots of the variables over here. OK. What did I do? Oh. All right, so before we move on with the, the talk, I want to give you a bunch of ways that you should be thinking about this r to the 1 over p to the e. All right, so um, the nice thing, as I've written it over here on this board, this r to the 1 over p to the e um, is an r module. Right? As we know, um, if I take a, um, uh, a module over the polynomial ring, it corresponds to a sheaf on affine space. If you want, um, uh, I don't need too much about this correspondence. Um, what I do need um, is that this. Okay, so here's where we're going. This is going to represent a vector bundle on affine space. So, but before I do that, maybe I'll give you a more perspective on this thing. Okay, so um, maybe you're not happy with this identification. Um, where I just took the roots on the right side. So let me do this more formally. All right, so again, R is a domain. So it lives inside its fraction field. Okay. And its fraction field, of course, lives inside an algebraic closure. All right, and the point here is that Inside of this algebraic closure, every element of R has a unique p to the eth root. And of course, the reason is just if I look at the equation t minus r. Well, I know this thing has a root. Call that root r to the 1 over p. And now, because I'm in characteristic p again, this equation is purely inseparable. Right? So it's the only root. On the left. t to the p minus r. Thank you. OK. So um, this inclusion here is really going on inside of one big Uber field, if you want. right? And the magic of Frobenius is, again, uh, 
if I look at a sum of p th roots and then take their pth power, the p pulls into each factor. If you like. So this gives me that the sum of p to the th or p th roots or p to the eth roots, either one. is again a pth root. Okay? Um, so this subset of elements, again, forms a, a, a subring of this guy. And of course, once I've done that, I can go on forever in any direction I want. Right? So here, I start with r. And we've got our two ways of thinking about the Frobenius map. Okay. All right, so I can think about Frobenius as being any one of these inclusions, um, all of which are going on as subrings of this k bar, if you like. Okay. All right, so there's the first way to think about this r to the 1 over p to the e. It's not just a formal trick of taking p to the e roots of variables. These things are all going on inside a fixed uh, algebraic closure of the fraction field of r, if you like. All right, so the second thing to, to think about for r to the 1 over p to the e is this guy. Is in fact a free R module of rank p to the e n. All right, so, um, OK. So uh, to convince you that it's a free R module, let me give you a basis. Okay, and so the basis is just going to be to take all of the monomials where the exponents uh, are strictly smaller than 1. All right, so. Uh, all of the denominators have to be p to the e. If I don't want to get bigger than 1, I had better keep the exponent or the numerators strictly less than p to the e. Okay? And of course, um, uh, the whole idea here is that if you ever have an integer exponent, uh, it just pulls out uh, of the R module structure because it's in R. Okay? Um, all right, so um, the punchline of this. is that I want you to think about for this talk I want you to think about this guy as being the sheaf of sections of some trivial vector bundle of rank p to the en on affine space. Right? And roughly speaking, all of the intuition for what we're going to do comes from this perspective. OK. Um, now. We want to use this guy to do, analyze uh, the local geometry of the zero set of f at the origin. So I want to extract the following heuristic from what was done in the last hour. All right, so um, <clears throat> the idea here is that 0 in the vanishing set of f is a worse singularity on 
I'm going to put quotes on this because of, uh, this is some kind of value judgment on an object which can't possibly have value judgments. All right. Uh, if and only if if and only if f vanishes faster near the origin. Okay. So in the last talk. In the last talk, we saw two examples of this. So um, the first one, if you will, if f has higher multiplicity, so the lowest order terms that show up in f all have uh, larger degree monomials, right? then uh, it's vanishing like a product of things that are vanishing. So it's vanishing faster, and so that's a worse singularity. Okay. Similarly, um, we said that, all right, so all right, so the idea is if you have a smaller log canonical threshold, so again, this was the minimum of them. OK, which one did I decide to do? All right, so if you look at the kernel 1 over f to the 2c, all right, and take, uh, ask when that is locally integrable near the origin, all right, so uh, I take the supremum over all such c's, and that's the log canonical threshold. The idea here is that if f is vanishing faster near the origin, okay, then you need a smaller value of c in order to make this thing not explode so badly. Okay? All right? So again, I don't have. According to your heuristic, because you could have a high multiplicity but a large log canonical threshold. If they're in, if they're in, there are some bounds relating these things, right? So, but I don't want to get bogged down at this point either. So, uh, again, uh, the idea I think still is that if f has say a high multiplicity here, this is vanishing very fast, so c has to be small. Uh, in in some way to make this integrable. Okay. So there is some. It's not a direct bound, but there is an inequality, right? So if I just look at the discrepancy corresponding to the the divisor of the origin, that gives me a bound. OK, um, so uh, what's the idea here? So we want to find some way that takes these heuristic um, and uses Frobenius to measure singularities. Right, so here's our big definition. OK, so. All right, so the f-pure threshold, if you want. OK, um, so denote it by this. And again, uh, I could make this definition at any point, but this is just uh, for the origin. All right, so let me pause real quick. Here, um, when I was working in characteristic zero, right, uh, and I took uh, norm square f, I could raise it to any real power I liked. Didn't really matter what kind of number c was. But in positive characteristic at this point, we've defined these rings r to the 1 over p to the e. The denominators, the, all of the exponents that show up are all rational numbers whose denominators are just pure powers of p. So at least for a while, the easy numbers for us to deal with are going to be the ones that just have the form a over p to the b. Right? And the idea here is that if I have uh, um, 
a number of this form, then I can look at f to the c, and I have some meaning for what that is. All right, OK, so this is going to be the supremum over all c's, so that All right, so I have a, a section of a vector bundle. Right? So um, I'm going to ask, for what c's does that not vanish? OK. Um, so again, here this just means that if I look at the identification, of r1 over p to the b with r p to the nb, right? and I write out f to the c, in terms of uh, its components, right? then at least one of these components can't vanish at the origin. So we need that some one of these guys is not in the maximal ideal of functions vanishing at the origin. OK? Supremum over what? Because you've got two things. You've got an A and you've got a. The supremum over all rational numbers oh, of the form A over P to the B, right? Um, so that this section, F to the C, is not, does not vanish uh, as a section of this vector bundle at the origin. OK? Um, and so, of course, um, here uh, it should be clear to you that you can translate this to whatever point in affine space that you prefer by switching to the maximal ideal corresponding to that point. What's the exponent on the bundle? Which bundle are you taking? Um, so uh, uh, part of the punchline here is that it's not going to matter. But here uh, I have, I'm looking at f to the c, right? So f to the a over p to the b. So that naturally lives in r to the 1 over p to the b. Right, so this is the, all of the, this is, I want the exponent to match whatever power I put on R there. And right? A is prime of C or prime? Doesn't matter, right? So um, although one can check that, right? So uh, if I am silly and I don't reduce my fraction, okay, um, it's, it still won't vanish, right? So it still gives me the same thing. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, let me also just say that here I've written it as a supremum. You could do it the other way around. All right, so again, uh, saying you vanish as a section of this vector bundle means that when I write you out in components, all of these guys have to be in the maximum ideal, right? So the, ma the guys where all of the components are in the maximum ideal is the maximum ideal times this module. Okay. All right, so I could also look uh, equivalently at the infimum over all c's so that f to the c uh, is inside of m uh, r1 over p to the b. Okay. It's not completely obvious that those two numbers are the same. It's not, right? So um, uh, I'm telling you it is. I leave it as an exercise for you to check for now if you're super industrious. And uh, if you're not, I leave it to you to have the machinery of the rest of the talk uh, and then prove it trivially at the end. OK. Let's do an example. Let's say I'm working in characteristic 2. So I guess I could have written x cubed plus y squared instead if you were afraid of signs. All right, so uh, if I write down f to the 1 half, so something in r to the 1 half, uh, one half power, right? so this gives me x to the 3 halves minus y. Right, now, when I view this inside of r to the 1 half, right? 
I want to uh, pull out the components, so I want to write it in terms of my obvious basis. Right? So the obvious basis are all the monomials uh, that have exponents that are strictly less than 1. Right? So I write this as, say, x times x to the 1 half minus y times 1. And so here's my basis showing up. All right, so I see immediately that uh, f to the 1 half is inside xy times uh, r to the 1 half. Okay? And again, of course, the conclusion here is, oh goodness, um, that the f pure threshold of f in characteristic 2 is uh, less than or equal to 1 half. Just doing this one computation. Okay. Let's check that it actually is 1 half. Okay, so this is a little bit more messy. So again, I'm allowed to take f to any exponent where the denominator is a power of p. Right? So I want to get as close to 1 half as I can with numbers like that. So let's look at 1 half minus 1 over 2 to the e. Okay? All right, which I can, of course, write as f to the 2 to the e um, minus 1 minus 1 over 2. Oh, goodness. OK. Um, so uh, let's worry about taking the roots later. So this is f to the, oh, OK. So x cubed minus y squared, 2 to the e minus 1 minus 1, all to the 1 half. All right, now, if I multiply this thing out, all right, let's look at least at one obvious thing. That e is really elusive. So uh, if I multiply this guy out, uh, well, uh, there are a bunch of obvious terms I can say have to show up with non-zero coefficients. I have to be a little careful here because, again, the whole point is that binomial coefficients can vanish in characteristic p. Right? However, the last one certainly does not vanish. Right? So let's look at what happens if I choose y every time I decide to multiply this thing out. So when I do so, OK. so. 2 to the e minus 1 minus 1 is certainly odd. Right? So that minus sign, which doesn't really matter, still stays the minus sign. Right? And I get y to the 2 to the e minus 2. OK? So when I bring the roots in, I'll get a bunch of terms. Um, and the last guy that shows up gives me uh, y to the 1 minus 1 over 2 e minus 1. In particular, the point is that I get something which is strictly less than 1 showing up here. So this shows that this guy is uh, not in m r to the 1 over 2 to the e. Okay. Um, so the 1 here is my component function. So this says that the f pure threshold is at least this big. right? So it's at least 1 half minus 1 uh, over 2 to the e for all e. Right? So the conclusion then is that um, this guy is at least this big. And if I let e go to infinity, I sandwich this in between. And f, this has to equal 1 half. OK? Is everyone happy with this example? Great. If uh, you want an exercise to play around with that's essentially the same computation, uh, just have some fun. Check again with the cusp x cubed minus y squared that if you're in characteristic 3, signs do matter this time, uh, you get uh, 2 thirds instead. Okay? So again, uh, we are at the main point of the, the, of the, the talk, or one of them. Right? So the theorem is that you always get rational numbers, but this is in no way obvious and requires quite a bit more 
uh, to do. Okay. By six here. Is it a limit? <laughs> what characteristic are you in? For if you take the limit over p going to infinity, what happens? So in this talk, we are working in a fixed characteristic. P does not change. And in Mircha's talk, it changes the entire time. So what the theorem is that if you take the limit of the F-pure thresholds after reduction mod p, you end up with the log canonical threshold. Um, but do, do, do we ever get uh, 5, 6 on the nose here? It's conjectured that you infinitely often get 5, 6 which uh, is supposed to be another example in my t OK, let's just do it now. <laughs> let's finish with the cusp, OK? How can you ever finish with the cusp? That's <laughs> Did you know it has another name? Yeah. If you look it up on Wikipedia, it's called Neal's semi-cubical parabola. <laughs> it was rec rectified by William Neal in 1857. Anyways. <clears throat> All right, so we dealt with the small primes. Um, so let's do the other ones. All right, so let's say that p is 1 mod 6. OK, let me bring my notes here so I don't screw this up. All right, so um, if p is 1 mod 6, then in particular I can write well, p to the e is also 1 mod 6. So I can write p to the e minus 1 is 6 times something, okay, for some integer m. And so the, the one I'm going to use is write down, okay, so there's 6 of them there. I only want 5. Right, look at f, uh, f to the 5m uh, over p to the e. Okay. Now if you do this, just to see where we're going. So again, let me pull the roots out last. OK, so here I've got uh, x cubed minus y squared to the 5m. So I can split up this 5m any way I like. So the way I choose to split it up is that two of the m's go here and three of them go over here. Right? Right, so uh, if two of them go here, I get x to the 6m. Three of them go here, I get y to the 6m. And there are lots of other terms that may or may not show up. And again, the key point here is what happens to the binomial coefficient in star. All right, so one can check that that star coefficient is always non-zero. There's one case where this is trivial to do, and that's when e is 1. Right? So if e is 1, right, then I'm raising things to the 5mth power. Uh, p, to the, uh, p minus 1 is equal to 6m, so 5m is less than p, so m is less than p, or 5m is less than p. So every binomial coefficient that shows up all the numbers involved when you write down the coefficient are all strictly less than p. So this is, is obviously non-zero. For larger e's, of course, I need to know which ones are and are not. All right, so, uh, and so to that end, so let's recall Lucas's theorem, which uh, gives me a way of telling uh, what binomial coefficients look like mod p. So let's say that I have a binomial coefficient a over b, and I write a in its base p expansion. Same thing with b. OK. Then the claim is, Lucas's theorem says that a, a b is equivalent to a0, b0, a1, b1. Mod p. In particular, um, 
the coefficient you get here, as long as these guys, OK, so all these coefficients, are between 0 and p minus 1 in the base p expansion. If this one is bigger than that one for each coefficient, you get something which is non-zero. Right? So the trick that's going to allow you to check it for star is to show essentially that all of these AIs that you're going to use are all p minus 1. So they're all as big as humanly possible. And so uh, I leave it to you as an exercise to do the mess and check that that coefficient is non-zero. But once you get that, that coefficient 6m is again p to the e minus 1. So if I divide by p to the e, I'll get x to the 1 minus 1 over p to the e, y to the 1 minus 1 over p to the e. And so this term is, again, not inside of there. Right? So this shows that the f pure threshold right, um, is uh, at least this big. And this is, uh, if you write it out, 5, 6 uh, times 1 minus 1 over p to the e. Right? And limiting as e goes to infinity gives you that it's at least 5, 6. And in general, again, just using the ideas from Lucas's theorem, it's uh, doable. But maybe I'll put a star here to say that uh, it's not so easy to do if you sit down to do it. It takes quite a bit of work. Um, uh, there's at least some mess to wade through. All right, so the f pure threshold, I've already told you what it is in characteristic 2 and 3 for all the others. If p is 1 mod 6, you get 5, 6. And if p is 5 mod 6, you get 5, 6 minus 1 over 6p. Um, so you see in this example that it limits to the log canonical threshold, which is the subject essentially of, or one of the things mentioned in the following talk with reduction. Uh, in general, the premium is never attained, right? Like at the, at the threshold, the. We attain 5, 6 all the time. I mean, in general, like you take uh, f and f to the. It, it's much more subtle than that, so it may or may not. Okay. All right, but uh, yeah. The answer is yes to your question. I'm right on this, right? Oh, it's, so it, it's, it's definitely a taint. So it's f split. Sometimes it, yeah, yeah. So sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. Right. Um, the reason this is a slightly harder question to answer than I would like is um, there are lots of different conventions in how you play with powers of p. Um, as you saw here, maybe in these examples, expressions like p to the e minus 1 show up a lot of the time. And sometimes you prefer to use p to the e. So if you use p to the e's, everything is always just powers of p is divisible by p. If you use those guys, nothing is ever divisible by p. Right? And depending on which of the two sides of the world you choose to work on, the answer may change. OK. Um, right, so. Like the clear universal bound for the the canonical well, so essentially yes, All right. So the log canonical threshold is always going to be bigger than or equal to, assuming you have something along with you. So the nice thing about these examples is I could reduce the resolution mm -hmm. in every sense of the word, right? In general, there are other things to worry about. If I write down some equation that has, uh, say. Uh, um, non-integer coefficients. Now I have to add those coefficients in to form an arithmetic family to do the reduction. But again, this is not the subject of the first talk. This is when you change the prime. The prime is fixed for this talk. OK, let's go back. So the goal was not to do the cusp first. It seems kind of silly. So what was the first example that anyone would do if you're studying singularities is you choose something non-singular and you do that first. 
right? So let's do a couple of examples uh, like that. OK, so um, let's state them as facts. All right, so first fact, right? So um, uh, I claim the FPR threshold is less than or equal to 1. Right? And then this is, again, easy. Why? Well, if I take f, there is no denominator already, or you can add them in if you like. Right? So this is f times 1. No matter what exponent set you choose, that's a basis element. Right? And this is essentially the idea that it doesn't matter which power you choose. Any one where the exponent makes sense will give you the same answer. OK. okay. Right, so it's less than or equal to 1. But the second important thing would be, of course, that it's not 0. Right, so All right, so how do I show this? Well, so let's take some huge integer e so that p to the e should be bigger than any exponent on any variable on any term inside of f. Right? So if I've done that now, then if I write down f, uh, if you like, um, each of the variables that show up if I divide by p to the e. Right, so I've rigged it so that after I divide by p to the e, the exponent on every variable is strictly less than 1. So when I write just down, write down f, and I do this, uh, f to the 1 over p to the e is a k-linear combination of basis vectors, so is in particular itself another uh, optional basis vector if you could have just changed basis on this guy. Okay. Um, and so in particular, it's not. in m r1 over p to the e. So this says that the f pure threshold is at least 1 over p to the e. OK? All right, so again, OK, just getting to the end of this discussion. So if this is supposed to be a measure of singularities in some way, and my heuristic was uh, you know, uh, that, so the heuristic here should be that smaller uh, epture thresholds are worse singularities again, um, and the smallest it can possibly be is 1, then if f is smooth, this had better be 1. Right? All right, so uh, if f is smooth at the origin, And I write it out in terms of its uh, homogeneous components. All right, so uh, degree i. OK, we know that this guy here is a non-zero linear form. And so in particular, I can change coordinates This first guy is just x1, if you want. (laughs) 
So now if I write down f to the 1 minus 1 over p to the e, right, and I expand this out, I'm going to get the first linear term to the p to the uh, e minus 1th power plus other terms. Right, so, and again, this guy is just, uh, after I've changed coordinates, x1 to the 1 minus 1 over p to the e. So this guy is not uh, a multiple of, of one of the other basis vectors by one of the variables. Okay, so this says that the f per threshold is at least 1 minus 1 over p to the e. So again, I found some way of approximating this from above and below to show that it's 1. All right, just as one more quick example, let's say that f is the product of two lines, x, y. Right, so again, same trick. f to the 1 minus 1 over p to the e is x to the same, y to the same. And again, so this guy is, n is one of the basis vectors, so this is not. Um, inside of here, so I also get that the f per threshold is 1. If you think about it some more, the same trick works if uh, this guy is uh, the leading f1. Right? So, Right, so again, I can change uh, coordinates so that the uh, lowest degree terms here are um, y squared minus x squared is the product of two different variables. Uh, and again, if I do the same exponent, uh, the variables are treated differently, so that's not in the maximum ideal times r to the over p to the e. Right, so again, if you have an ordinary uh, double point uh, in, on a plane curve, then you again get the f per threshold as 1 as big as humanly possible. All right, so the theorem, at least in this form, uh, I'll, to save time, let me not write out the names and just tell them to you. So proven in different ways by uh, two sets of people, uh, Blickla, Mustaza, and Smith, um, and then by Katzman, Lubeznik, and Zhang, right, says that the f per threshold is, in fact, a rational number. Okay? Um, the proof I'm going to give is from, uh, or I'm going to discuss, is the first one from BMS here. Do you know that f to this number always vanishes? Is it obvious? Uh, it's not. It's, that's the point is it doesn't, as a section of this vector bundle, it's, it may or may not vanish. Okay. What happens when you blow up? This is a great question, right? Um, so uh, <clears throat> the short answer is that it's very complicated. And no one really understands. Um, the, in characteristic zero, there are precise transformation rules as to uh, how to compare to the multiplier ideals um, on, uh, after you blow up. Uh, and here, there are precise rules for finite maps. But it may get really crazy when you look at a birational component as well. But that was a loaded question, because if, if you could answer that, probably you could resolve. So. Um, so bringing up uh, something else that we don't have, even though it's uh, 
right, in characteristic p. So I don't have resolutions if I'm in dimension bigger than 3 or something, something, something. So, um, but even if you did, the resolutions don't really behave like they did in characteristic 0. So a lot of the vanishing theorems on the resolutions are known to be false even if you have the resolution at hand. So these things often behave very differently. Right? Um, yeah. So. Elementary question. So you could be thinking of f as a polynomial, but presumably I can do the same, similar thing if I think of it as a power series. So everything I've done so far, you can do as a power series as well, as long as you have again a perfect field. And if I start with a polynomial and I compute this in the power series ring, it doesn't change. That's right. Um, and so if you prove the theorem in the power series ring, that's a stronger statement and implies the polynomial case. Um, and in fact, the proof given here works in the polynomial ring case, or it works in the power series ring case as well. Is there also a variant for ideals? There is also a variant for ideals. Um, and hopefully I'll discuss that later. But if I don't get to it, please ask me over lunch. And just to ask a question about this example, is it always the case for an ordinary singularity that, that it's one? or? So if f defines an ordinary singularity in whatever sense that this means, then Mircea is going to tell us I believe the answer is one is yes. Am I correct? No. The answer is no. <laughs> so, oh no no ordinary. Sorry, now I'm mixing up my terms. The word ordinary is throwing me off. So so yeah. So. <clears throat> so uh, if we're talking about an ordinary prime for a oh. abelian variety, then the answer is yes. Which is where my statement's coming from. But again, we're not doing reduction mod p, so uh, we're not going to do that. So. Um, if I was, again, working in characteristic 0 here, and I was trying to convince you that the law of canonical threshold was rational, the key ingredient in the proof that was discussed last time was resolution of singularities, which I don't have. Right? And even if I did have it, would not give me this theorem. Okay? Um, so uh, I think you can partition the universe into two sets of people, people who think that in characteristic 0 that's a very hard theorem or a very easy Theorem, right? So the question is, if you believe that hitting uh, with the hammer of resolution of singularities is something that's natural and easy, then of course that's a hard theorem in characteristic zero. And if you just black box that theorem, then it's very easy to show the rest of the proof. So the main ingredient really is just uh, showing that you can compute uh, these things after after the resolution. Um, but you can show it directly just for the log canonical threshold. I can't show this theorem without showing a bunch of other related invariants that are also rational at the same time. Right, so something very different-ish going on in positive characteristic. So let me tell you what those other invariants are. I think that's the only known proof. Am I correct? It is, I don't know how to do it otherwise. Well, you could reduce the characteristic P in the field. If you have that it's a limit of rational numbers again. Right. Yeah. Unless you also know that it's equal a lot of the time, um, which is the conjecture again about reduction mod p, which is the subject of the next talk. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so let's do some other invariants. All right, so I want to tell you what the test ideals are, and so again, just uh, I'm going to do this for all c's, but. To start off, let's say c is, again, a rational number with only powers of p in the denominator. Um, so I'm going to claim that this is a very natural thing to do. So this is going to be an ideal inside of the polynomial ring. And this is, I want to call it the component ideal. Right, so again, take this section of this vector bundle. Right, and to get the f-pure threshold, we were asking that it didn't vanish. Right, so let's say that it does vanish, and I want some measure of how badly it vanishes. Then the obvious thing to do is to look at each one of the components and see how badly that vanishes. Okay? So uh, if I take f to the c here, and I write it as, again, in terms of, say, the exponent uh, vectors, write all the components down, right? The test ideal here is just the ideal generated by the components. Okay, so 
Maybe this is best done by example. All right, so where we started off before, the first example, f to the 1 half here was x, x to the 1 half minus y times 1. All right, so these are the basis vectors. These guys are my components, all right? And so tau of f to the 1 half is the ideal generated by these components. Okay? Um, and again, the heuristic here is that worse singularities Should correspond to deeper ideals, right? So if this thing has components, if they vanish much faster, right? If they're all higher degree, whatever you want to measure this by again, um, if that happens, then the singularity vanishes more with respect to viewing this thing as a section of uh, of the sector bundle. So these are the analogs of the multiplier ideals that weren't quite defined last hour. That's right. Okay. <laughs> deeper is not in quotes, right? Because <laughs> well, ideals are not linearly ordered. So, right, so the problem with putting this down is if I give you two ideals where neither is contained in the other, this says very little. But certainly, I want to view that if I take uh, two different uh, guys, say with the same exponent or whatever you want to say it, and I get smaller test ideals for one of the two, then that's a worse singularity from this perspective. Okay. So as I said, I want to define this for all Cs. I think this is a very natural measure of how badly this thing does vanish if it does. Okay? Um, it's easy to do it for Cs where the new denominator is just a power of p. Um, and what we're going to do is sort of limit with that to get it for an arbitrary uh, exponent. All right, so to do that, let's say I take two exponents, both again with only powers of p in the denominator, and I'm free to take a common denominator for both. So let's say, all right, so look at two rational numbers, a over p to the b and a prime over p to the b again, where um, c prime is uh, bigger than or equal to c. Then the claim is then it reverses the order. Right, so tau of f to the c prime is contained in tau of f to the c. All right, <clears throat> so in order to do this, let's make the following observation. So another way to write uh, tau of f to the c, OK, so I'm trying to pick out all the components. Um, right? So uh, if I write r1 over p to the b uh, in terms of its components, and I want to get the components, what I do is I hum that into r, and I take the dual basis vectors if you want, and that just spits out all of the entries. Right? So um, another way to think about this is this is just the image of the evaluation map from hum r1 over p to the b back to r, where I evaluated f to the c. Right, that just picks out the components. This is a nice perspective in many ways. In particular, um, that looks kind of weird because I had to choose a basis to do it. Okay, this makes it very clear that whatever choice of coordinates you did, it doesn't matter. Right? Uh, this gives you the same ideal. Okay. All right. So once I have this, the statement just pops out. So let's say I want to evaluate something. Oops, I erased the thing, so I'm trying to show this guy. All 
right, so I want to pick something inside of here. This comes up as evaluation, a homomorphism at f to the c prime. OK, um, so uh, if I take this guy and I look at phi prime of f to the c prime, well, this is the same thing as writing right? I can change that f to the c prime to an f to the c prime minus c. And the point is that this I can think of is another map from r to the 1 over p to the b back to r. Right, so here, um, so uh, if here I have the map uh, phi prime, and here I have multiplication by f to the c prime minus c, that's an R module homomorphism from R to the 1 over p to the b back to R to the 1 over p to the b. Right, so I can define a new map which is pre-multiplication of that guy by f to the c prime minus c. All right, so any time I look at one of these images for c prime, it is the image of one of the guys for c. All right? And that does the whole thing. OK? Like in terms of push forward, something like that. Um, the R to the 1 over P to the B is the push forward of R under Frobenius. No, but, but the test ideal. The test ideal is not. So it's still going to be some, you still have to take images of maps somewhere. right? Um, this evaluation map where you evaluate is some kind of uh, something called the uh, trace map. Right? And it relates very strongly to duality for a finite map. So roughly speaking, this is the perspective that the, tr the test ideal is the image under these sort of trace map. OK, so um, uh, there's our first lemma. The second one, all right, so let's do the definition. So uh, let's say that you take a rational number which is not a over p to the b. Then what I'm going to do is just set tau of f to the c to be, OK, so I can write this in many ways. These things are supposed to be getting uh, bigger as you decrease the exponent, right? So. I'm going to build this up by choosing one of the things I have defined it for. Right? Um, I, and for each one of those, I can form the test ideal. And those are, I want to be inside of tau f to the c, and I just take the union. Now, of course, we've shown that as these numbers are getting uh, smaller, these ideals here are getting larger. Right? So um, I could write this in any different ways. I could also write this as, or I could write this, I'm sorry, as a sum as well, right? Um, or I can write it as a max, too, right? So they're all nested. So uh, since my ring is no theory, and these things have to stabilize, so eventually they stop somewhere, right? And when I do that, I'll get some extra information, right, that Right, so you can always increase on the right just a little bit, and the test ideal stays the same. So if you know something about uh, accumulation points, so maybe I have to worry about this here too, right? Uh, but I don't think so. So just to define it. So 
A posteriori, yes. A priori, no. All right. Um, OK, so, but I'm crashing into the end, so let me, let me try. It's always no. So for no, you can, I can write this right. OK. Um, speaking of which, <laughs> OK. So um, what we know is if you take one of these guys, you're allowed to increase a little bit, and the test that you'll say is the same. So if I look here at the C spectrum and just keep F fixed, right? this gives me a family of ideals. Right, where um, the test ideal is constant on each piece. Moreover, they should get smaller um, after that. Right, so they're changing from one interval to the next, if you want. These numbers here are called the f-jumping numbers. Okay. Moreover, the first one is one we've been talking about this whole time. This first one is the f-truth threshold. Why? Well. If you take any f, we argued at the very beginning right, that uh, um, if I raise f to the 1 over p to the eth power, e is huge, then this thing is part of a basis. And hence, the component ideal is the unit ideal. Right? Um, and exactly where that stops is the f truth threshold, where it, it's no longer written as the I'll no longer get a unit for all the components. Was whether you knew if f to this f pure threshold vanished, doesn't everything in the test ideal vanish in the sense it's written as? So maybe, but this perspective, the answer is maybe you're right. So maybe it's by definition does not vanish here and then vanishes here for the first time. Okay. All right. So again, here the test ideal is trivial, right? Um, and here the test ideal is non-trivial for the first time. OK, so the, the follow-up theorem right here says uh, that the f jumping numbers No, you may get something. It may go from R to something which is not the maximal ideal. Right. But you need the maximal ideal in order for, for the Xi1 to be the. Ideal. Everything's contained inside the maximal ideal. So when it, the only thing that you're missing is. No. At least not as I've written it here, I guess. I'm trying to sweep a lot of this under the rug. These invariants are local, right? So uh, uh, you're right. I can fix this in two ways. I can make the ring local, or I can uh, work in a sufficiently small neighborhood of the origin. Yeah. Or I can work with power series. But then I can't give the same proof. All right, so um, I want to do sort of one more thing and then call it a day. Right, so let me tell you some of the key ingredients in the proof. Um, the first one is easy to check. All 
Right, so if I take tau f to the c where c is uh, bigger than or equal to 1, then in fact I can write that component ideal, the f just pulls out. Okay? And again, uh, this just uh, falls straight out of our definitions, if you will. What this means is that while I've listed these things as an infinite string of numbers, everything is determined uh, in some sense by what happens uh, between 0 and 1. Okay? The second one is a bit more mysterious. And what it says is that p times an f jumping number is also still an f jumping number. So this is something which, if you look at the analog of these things in characteristic 0, is not true. right? But again, is straightforward from what we've done. Right? So um, what do I mean? Right? So uh, if I write uh, f to the c and I pull out its components, I can think of the Frobenius map here as being uh, composed of two parts. So I can write it as the map from r to r to 1 over p to the b minus 1 and then I can go and add the last root. Now r1 over p to the b minus 1 is again a free uh, r module, so I can decompose there, right? And then I can decompose the last step. And if you do that, uh, you'll get a relationship between tau f to the c uh, and tau f to the pc. Namely, Right. In the language we've used, the component ideal of uh, tau f to the cp, 1 over p, is tau f to the c. All right. So if, as I'm varying c, these guys change, uh, then so do these. Okay. And the last idea is I can say something, and this is really where it's important we work in the polynomial ring. Let's say that the degree of f is d. Then this implies in particular that uh, tau f to the 1 over um, tau f to the c. Right. So if I can bound the degree of f, uh, I can bound the degree of the generators of the test ideals. Right. Again, how does this work? Well, uh, if f has degree d, let's be a little sloppy here, f to the c is made up of terms of uh, uh, degree c times d. Right. Now, uh, when I do that, I'm going to uh, break off the integer component right? and put all the fractional stuff as part of the basis vectors. So the integer component of that are exactly the bounds that you get that's obvious on the degrees of the components. Okay. Um, those are all the ideas. So here's how you finish the proof. Right? First you show discreteness. Okay? <laughs> so um, because uh, of this guy, everything is determined by what happens uh, between 0 and 1. If, say, you had um, uh, accumulation point, right? Uh, you can uh, check to see that you would have to have one between 0 and 1, so we just have to rule that out, right? And if I have an accumulation point, this multiplying by p and bringing it back, um, uh, okay, so say that again. So if there is an accumulation point, it happens with things uh, less than 1, and now I can bound the degrees of the generators for guys where c is less than 1 in terms of the degree of f, right? So um, everything is determined by its intersection with polynomials of degree less than a fixed 
number. So there are only finitely many such ideals. Right? So there are no accumulation points between 0 and 1, so there are no accumulation points at all. All right, so uh, next statement. All right, so once I have discreteness, it's easy to check rationality. Um, if you had an irrational jumping number, then, well, I can multiply by p as many times as I want, and then subtract off and take integer parts and get back between 0 and 1. And if you start it off with something irrational, that's going to give you a contradiction, because you'll have a non-discrete set between 0 and 1. All right? And those are all the ideas. Um, let me say that, one, you can do this in power series rings, but then this you can't do, because there are no degrees. <laughs> okay, so this proof, uh, which is very elementary and uh, amazing, breaks down completely, because it's backwards. Um, uh, in the power series ring, the original proof uh, for principal ideals uh, still works. If you do the extension to non-principal ideals, um, that proof does not. So uh, it is known for arbitrary ideals, um, but uh, this was so. This is a result of myself and Carl Schwedt. Right? And let me stop there. Stupid question: Is there a mixed threshold, or why is there pure? It's a name. So um, <laughs> the word test. And the word F pure, right, are some things uh, which are historical artifacts of how these things were discovered, I guess. So uh, the F pure comes out of, uh, there's a notion of what it means to have a pure extension of rings. It's closer related to what it means for that extension to be split. Um, and uh, so we can talk about the Frobenius extension being pure, and that's where the word F pure comes from. We should go to, to lunch. Thanks, Kevin, again. And <laughs> <laughs>